Christ, there is no one like our God. For our prayer week, we will be focusing strictly on prayer time and strictly on the Word of God as it applies to prayer. So tonight we begin in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, we'll see how far we get. Philippians chapter 4, the pericope that I'm focusing on is, is found in verses 4 through 9. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4, 4 through 9. Aren't you glad there's nobody like our God? Amen. There is no God like him. There is no person like him. There is no one like our God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. In the New Testament, we are in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, we always begin the week of uh, the New Year in prayer. And we always begin the week of New Year studying scriptures that deal with prayer. So after I've said my piece about Philippians chapter 4, then those of you who would volunteer to come and pray, please feel free to do that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. Uh, first thing Apostle Paul does is express his love for them. He, he talks about them as brothers and sisters in Christ. He reminds them that the joy, the peace, and the crown of the Lord must be steadfast unto them. Now let me just tell you, there's no discrimination going on, but he had to set two women straight. Right off the bat in chapter four, there were two women who followed him in ministry. They supported him in ministry. They were strongly a part of his ministry. Matter of fact, they united together in ministry. But along the way, they got off course and they began to fight against each other. When I say fight, I don't mean knock down, drag out. They had some scrimmages, scrimmages against each other. So he reminds the church to welcome them, to plead with them, to, to honor them, to love them. He gets to chapter 4, verse number 4, and he says, rejoice. When you look at the, the background of Philippians, you will find out that it's a need for him to tell the people rejoice because they were going through some tough times, some trials, some tribulations. They were going through some troubles. They were going through situations that they'd rather not go through. Anybody go through anything every now and then that you'd rather not, you'd rather not be here, rather not be at this point? And here we are at the first of the year, and we're reminding each other that we got to go through some things we don't want to go through. That's right. Some situations, some things with people, things with jobs, things in the neighborhood, things in relationships. And we're looking at God saying, God, I would rather not be here. But Paul writes this book to the Philippi, the church at Philippi, the Philippians, and he says to them, right off the bat, rejoice. Meaning to have joy again and have joy again and have joy over and over again. Now, I do realize and I do respect the fact that it's not easy to have joy when you're going through some things. Yes? yes true. You may be able to have joy when things are looking good, but it's tough to have joy when you got some things going on that you'd rather not go through. Amen. Yes? Yes. And when you're going through some things that you'd rather not go through, sometimes it's very tempted to be depressed in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. To be beaten down. To feel like God has forgotten. When you're going through some things, Paul said, even as you go through, you need to find a way to rejoice in the Lord. And he has the nerve, the audacity, the gall to say, 
when you rejoice, while you're rejoicing, whatever you do, do it always. And it's easy sometimes to rejoice when things are going well, but it's not as easy when things are going bad. Children up in uproar. Finances are short. Government upside down. Nation doesn't know where we're headed. It's hard to rejoice. When life gives you bad stuff, evil stuff, people who just don't like you for just because you evil. Anybody been around people that just that's mad with the world? They don't they don't want to be around anybody. And if you get around them, they, they'll give you a piece of their mind. And so Paul understands the situation that Paul says, rejoice in the midst of trouble, rejoice in the midst of tribulation, rejoice in the midst of trials. Do you have to remind yourself to rejoice when you're going through anybody? Mm -hmm. Do you have to remind yourself to rejoice? Do you have to remind yourself to be happy? Because we got some things going on that we're not happy about. I am not the only one in the room. There are just some things that can happen in your life that does not bring you happiness. That's right. The good thing is when you are a Christian, when you live a Christian life, you are able to know that it's time to rejoice even in trouble. He says, not only should we rejoice, but we ought to rejoice in the Lord. And we ought to do it always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Whenever somebody sees you, they ought to see joy. Whenever somebody crosses your path, they ought to see you rejoicing. Whenever people see you going through some things, they ought to see you rejoicing regardless of what you're going through. Anybody can testify that they rejoice all the time, always. Anybody, just one person in the room, that you rejoice all the time, and every time you look up, you just got this joy about you, and this uh, situation that nothing can shake you, nothing can bother you. Anybody? Mm -mm. Nobody. Mm -mm. Well, we still on planet Earth, we still got some work to do, and we still got to let God do some work on us, right? right. But Paul says, though, you got to get to a point where it doesn't overtake you. You have to get to a point where it matters, but it's not the whole thing in your life. Yeah. Don't let your situation overtake you. Mm -hmm. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Now, let me just tell you, he's not saying rejoice because you're having trouble. Mm -hmm. I know many times this has been taught and preached. They're saying, rejoice because you can feel the pain. Mm -hmm. That's not what Paul said. He's not saying rejoice because you got trouble because some people have come to the conclusion that if I have trouble, that guarantees me a spot in heaven. Just like some people have come to the conclusion if I'm poor, I know I'm going to heaven. How do we get to heaven? How is it our finances that are lack thereof that gets up to heaven? Does God have a problem? Does God have a problem with you having finances? Why not? Is it, <laughs> doesn't it say that, the, that money is the root of all evil? The Bible doesn't say that? Why, why does people say that then? Is it not true that money is the root of all evil? No. No? Am I not quoting the Bible when I say money is the root of all evil? Well, that's got some words. What does that mean? So for the love of money is the root of all evil. That means if you love money more than you love God, you do anything to get money. If you love the increase of money more than you love God, you would do anything to there are some senior citizens even today who have to lock their doors, the door to their room, and put padlocks on there in addition to the, the lock that the key goes into. Why is that? 
Is it because of people on the outside coming in? They fear those that are in. Many times it's because of family members who, who just got to have money for a good fix. Mm -hmm. Or got to have money to get their stuff. I told you the story about a boy broke in a woman's house. Broke in a woman's house. She Her phone rang and it showed that someone was in her house by way of her camera. She goes home and she confronts him on the side of the house. And when she confronts him, he lunges at her and he shoots, she shoots him. Well, you know, the cameraman and the, the news reporter always find the worst one to talk on camera. Yep. The one that, you know, they preview people before they put you on camera anyway. Yep. And they will tell you, I don't want the articulate one. No, I don't, I don't want you, I want this one on camera. So his cousin gets on camera and she says, how else is he going to get his money? She didn't have to shoot him. He got to get his money from somewhere. There's a thing called work. It's called trouble. It's called using your hands, your head, and your leg to get finances. So it's not true. It's not true that money is the root of all evil. evil. It is the love of money. It is the love of money. So people have come to the conclusion that they can get to heaven just because they're poor. Some people have come to the conclusion that they can get to heaven just because they're oppressed. Some people think they can throw pity parties and get to heaven. So now you Bible scholars tell me, how do we get to heaven? If it's not the love of money, if it's not a pity party, if it's not crying all night, if it's not begging God, how do we get there? Anybody? How do we, how do I guarantee my reserved spot in heaven? By, by accepting God as our Savior. By accepting? God as our Savior, living in that manner. By accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior? And what's that caveat you added on the end? And living your life as such. Okay. I see. We are saved by Jesus alone. We are not saved by how we do things. We are not saved by our deeds. We are saved, we are born again through the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary. Period. Nothing else, no one else, nothing we can do. God has made this thing so simple that even a baby can figure it out. If a baby hears the word, if a small child hears the word, trust this story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that child can be saved. We have polished it up and propped it up. What are some other things we propped up and said? The way you get to heaven is you do this and do this. What are some of the other things we've said? How do we get to heaven? If you ask this question, how do you get to heaven? If you ask somebody the question, how do you get to heaven? What are some of the answers you've heard? Yeah. What are we talking? Go to prayer. Through prayer? Through going to church? Anybody else? Just be good. Just be good? Do unto others as others do unto you? Anybody else? Those are some of the things you heard, the way to get to heaven. Yes, ma'am. I saw something and I was supposed to core about it. It's uh, something they're advertising now. Are you going to heaven or hell? And then it, it gave a, uh, to find out, go to heaven or hell.net. I said, now this person just needs to, if anybody said, I didn't go to the Okay, so what are some of the ways that people say that you can get to heaven? What are some of the ways? You never heard that? Y'all not having these conversations? You never heard of these conversations? Let's deal with the be good thing. How good is good enough to get to heaven? What can you do to get there? How do you make sure you get there? How good is good enough?
We talk about getting to heaven now. We talk about salvation, not sanctification. How do we get to heaven? I want to make sure that every member, every visitor, every listener understands how we get to heaven. How do we are, how are we saved? How do we get saved? We know it's not by money. We know it's not by oppression. We know it's not, not by, by people being mean to us or we throw up titty parties. So how is it? Some people think they get to heaven just by going to church. Church attendance. Does church attendance get us to heaven? Well, why are we going to church then? Why are we going to church? Why are we going to church? So we don't go to church to be saved. We go to church because we're sick. And we go to the hospital because we're sick. Because every saved soul is still sick, right? And we'll have some sickness until Jesus gets back. And when I talk about sickness, I'm not talking about uh, physically sick. I'm talking about spiritually got issues. Raise your hand if you got just one issue. Just one. Raise two if you got ten. <laughs> Yeah, just one issue, just one issue. Either it's a person, place, thing, mannerism, thought pattern, whatever. See, because Paul writes this letter to rearrange the thoughts of the people. He, he, says, he says, rejoice not because you ought to be happy because your troubles are here. He says, rejoice because of your relationship with God and you're trusting what God is doing even behind the scenes. In my troubles, I can trust God. In my bad situations, I can trust what God is doing. Because I have a relationship with him. And my relationship with God says to me that I can trust him because he's my father and he's going to look out for what's best for me. What's best for me? I can always tell when there's a disconnect. I, I'm still saved. I'm still God's child. God's still my father. But I can get up in the morning rushing to get things done and forget to spend quality time with him. And guess what? I spend about 40 minutes when I could have spent 10 minutes just spending quiet time with him. Then I spend 40 minutes getting back to where I should have started. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like GPS. If I had just looked at the route of the GPS before I got started, I would have known they would take me all the way around 16 to get back to that team. But if I had just spent five minutes to scan through it, because some people think GPS knows it all. I mean, they think GPS is spot on. If GPS was spot on, people wouldn't be running off in bayous and lakes and rivers. Follow GPS. And some people will follow GPS even when they see it's going the wrong way. Going to Galveston to get to Dallas. Now, last time I went to Dallas, I didn't go to Galveston, but I'm here. I'm going to follow this GPS. And that's how people are when they follow traditional statements, when they follow things that's been said over and over again. We picked up some bad habits in church. We picked up some terrible doctrine in church. So the only way to get to heaven is to trust the story of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, his finished work on the cross. Ephesians 2 says, Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, chapter 8 and 9, that this is a gift of God. This is saved by grace. This is saved through faith. Jesus' grace, God's grace, God's faith upon our lives saves us. And then it goes on to say, this is not of your works. So you can't even brag about it. And only the saved have the right to call on God and God do something about it. God can do something about it 
if you are born again. You have to be. You've got to be. You must be born again. Born is good. So if you if you need Jesus to get your prayers heard, you certainly need Jesus to rejoice in times of trouble. And let me tell you something. When trouble hits, it, it doesn't come in and pat cake. Trouble comes in with knockout punches. <laughs> Trouble shows up, and I mean, it comes in like Floyd Mayweather. I was watching a fight with Floyd, Floyd Mayweather, and a guy, he was complaining to the referee, he was complaining to the referee, he hit me here, hit me here. Floyd says, stop whining and stop crying in the box. Stop crying in the box, stop whining in the box. He was just, this guy just complaining to the referee. He did this, he did this. He said, stop whining in the box. And then he knocked him out. We have to get to a point in our lives where we can actually deal with life and rejoice. And when we rejoice, our countenance reflects who God is. When we rejoice in trouble, People can see you going through some stuff and they know you're struggling, they know you're going through it, but when they look at it, at you, they can't tell you. Because you rejoice. Because the word for rejoice, the, the root word for rejoice is joy. And joy comes from the inside. And it shows up on the outside. Paul says, have joy over and over again and rejoice in the Lord. Even while you're in your trouble, rejoice in the Lord. And then, as if you didn't hear him the first time, guess what else he says in verse number four? Rejoice. Again, I say to you, rejoice. He sets the stage for prayer. He sets the stage for prayer because many times we can pray in distress and the Holy Spirit takes what we would say of what our hearts are saying, and it presents it before God. The Holy Spirit presents our prayers before God. And we are rejoice. We are rejoice because we know God got it, and God has us. God has us. God got it. Now let me tell you, in the middle of the accident, that's hard to see. In the middle of trouble, it's hard to see. But when you have the right relationship with God and you have the right understanding of who God is, you can find some joy in the midst of the storm. What is God doing? God, you still there? God, can you do something? Rejoice in the Lord. Verse 5, he says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Let your gentleness, this word gentleness means calmness, fairness. And check this out. The word gentleness means your sacrificial offering unto the Lord. I'm not talking about money. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. So we ought to have a sacrificial offering unto the Lord in such a way it says in the presence of other people. Look what it says, verse number five. It says, it says, let your gentleness be calm. Be so calm until you are fair. Be fair. And this is a sacrifice. He already said, whatever you do, rejoice. And then he comes back and says, make the sacrifice of how you present yourself in the midst of trouble before other people. He says, the Lord is at hand. The Lord, the first thing about the Lord is at hand, the Lord is present. And wherever the, the Lord is, there's peace, there's power, there's joy, there's strength, and there's hope, wherever the Lord is. First of all, the Lord is present, the Lord is at hand. 
The second thing that Paul points out when he says the Lord is at hand, he's referring to the coming of Jesus the Christ. All the way back in biblical days, they thought that Jesus was going to come back at any moment. Now, here we are in 2024, and I'm here to tell you, Jesus can come back at any moment. He's reminding the people, whatever you do, make sure you rejoice. Make sure you enjoy this thing here. Make sure you give your life sacrificially unto the Lord. Because at any moment, Jesus can crack the sky. Any second, the Lord will be at hand. He's present. He's here. He's with us. So he says to us, first of all, in our troubles, the Lord is with us. In our trials, in our tribulation, the Lord is with us. The Lord is at hand. Secondly, he says, while you are walking with him, make sure that others see that the Lord is with you. He says, he says your gentleness, your calmness, should be of such that people can see that the Lord is with you. And the third thing he says, the Lord is at hand. He says to us tonight, you got hope in the fact that Jesus is coming back. The same Jesus that left on a cloud, he's coming back on a cloud. I don't know how David Perez led so many people for so long, mm. making them think that he was Jesus or he was the Messiah or he was the Christ. How do people get involved in that? When you read the Bible, the Bible says he left on a cloud. The Bible says he's coming back on a cloud. David Koresh was born of a woman. He didn't show up on a cloud. What's the guy from Guyana tragedy? Jim Jones. How does a preacher, well, how does a dude get somebody to drink some stuff, some poison, and we all going to go to heaven together? How did they get to that point where they trusted the man so much that they thought he was the Messiah, was the Christ? There's a hole in there because when we leave here, we won't leave here by drinking something. We're going to leave here on a cloud. The Bible says he will stop in midair. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who still walk around and remain, we will be caught up with him in midair. And it says, and we will forever be with the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And then he says in verse 18, comfort one another with these words. I know you're going through hard times. Make sure you give people hope. Comfort them. So whatever we're going through is just temporary. We hate it. It hurts. It hinders. But it's just temporary. Hallelujah. Because the Lord is at hand. It goes on to say, verse number six, don't be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious. This word anxious translate the cares of this world. Don't let the cares of this world overpower you. Don't be anxious for anything. Don't be so anxious. And it also translated be careful. Don't be careful. Don't be so careful that you miss Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. Don't let the troubles of this world soak your mind up. Don't let the things you're going through manipulate your heart. Be careful that you don't let things pollute your heart. I thought I'd never hear the day that news reporter said, there's a lot going on. Now when the news reporter has no more words, and the news reporter says, there's a lot going on. Now these are people who are professionals and they report the news and they report one tragedy after the other. And when David Muir comes on at, at 530, he says, just into our newsroom every single day. 
It tells us that something happened between 12 o'clock news, the 2 o'clock news, the 3 o'clock news, and now the evening news at 5.30, and there's a lot going on. And the thing about it is, we only hear the tip of the iceberg of what's going on. A lot of stuff going on. And when the news reporter says a lot going on, let me tell you, there's a lot going on. The next thing that David Muir said, we have a lot to cover. <laughs> we have a lot to cover today. From bad weather to storms to fires to, to people being arrested to people being sliced at the border to people dying trying to get to I mean, there's a lot going on. Paul says, don't let these cares of this world get you down. He says, don't even fight against the cares. Just trust Jesus in them. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, we're not rejoicing because we got trouble. I mean, we've heard it preached that way and talked that way. Oh, man, just rejoice we've got trouble. Let me put it on a physical realm for you. What happens is, when you talk to some people who are super spiritual, and you say you got aches and pain, they say, well, just be glad you can feel the pain. Amen. Just rejoice that you can feel the pain. What they're saying is, you still got your life, you can still do something good for the Lord. Yeah. If you can feel the pain. And I'm not talking about just physical pain, I'm talking about heartaches, trouble. Man, I said, I got an itch that I can't scratch trouble that we can't do anything about. He said, don't be anxious. Don't let these things get you down. But in everything through prayer and supplication, make your request known unto who? Unto God. Everything. At this point, we have to get to the point where, where we, we pray and supplicate with thanksgiving. What's the difference between prayer and supplication? Think about it before you say it. What's the difference between prayer and supplication? I'll give you a clue here. All supplication is prayer, but not all prayer is supplication. All supplication is prayer, but not all prayer is supplication. See, prayer created a communication between us and God. I said many times, prayer is a dialogue between us and God. God talking to us and we talking to God. Has God said anything to you lately? Or do you feel like the, the prophets of old and said, God, you shut up heaven on me? You know, we quote, we quote the, the Chronicle scripture that says, it says that, that if if there's no cattle in the stall, there's no crop in the field, God still says, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, I will heal the land. What would it be like if the if the President of the United States of America just says there is no business on this day, we're going to call for a nationwide prayer. Mm. What would it be like if we shut down everything? All the stores are shut down. All communication, all jobs are shut down. What if, what if the president would do as Esther said? Said, I'm going before the king, and I want you all to pray and to fast because if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to trust the God that I serve to bring me back out. Because well, the president of these great United States of America would stop for a moment. No more legislation. No more signing bills. No, no more signing things into laws. And he demanded that Greg Abbott would shut down Texas and pray. There would be a miracle from the law. 
If we could just get the governor to stop momentarily and pray. If we could just get the mayor to stop and pray. Call for a prayer time. He says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. And when you pray and supplicate, make sure you do it with thanksgiving. First of all, prayer is communicating with God. Secondly, supplication is it's when you intercede for others and when you intercede in such a way that you can actually feel. You know, when Jesus was interceding for us in John chapter 17, the Bible says oh, sweat dropped like drops of blood. When you really look at that Greek text, it says that, that Jesus pours, was, he, he was praying in such a way, and he was agonized until blood came from his pores. And we can't get 10 minutes in. What if men would pray? What if spouses would pray? What if families would go back to praying? What if we turn the iPad, the phone, the TV off long enough to say we're going to have some prayer time? What would our nation look like? What would our conditions be like? He says, don't, don't get excited because we got a different prayer time. Don't get excited because there's total confusion. Don't get bent out of shape because Life is not what you would have it and not what it has been in the past. Don't get all bent out of shape. But he says, while it's been out of shape, while things are going crazy, you ought to call on God in prayer. Talk to him. Tell him all about it. Songwriter said, tell him about your troubles. Walk with him. Somebody said, but, but preacher, I've been praying. And he ain't acting like I weren't that. But we, because of our relationship with him, we still trust him. We don't trust what we see. You see, faith is trusting in something you can't see. Faith is seeing something coming to reality that's not there yet. Say faith is, is when you've all been out of shape and you're praying unto God and God sounds like he's not going to answer. He looks like he's not going to answer. He acts like he's not going to answer. And it actually looks like my prayers are like bouncing ping pong balls that's never escaping the room. Hitting the roof and the side of the walls and coming right back at me. When you pray, and when you supplicate, when you supplicate, you're really calling God from the bottom of your bowels, asking God to change conditions, to change things, to change people. And he says, when you do it, do it with thanksgiving. You see, sometimes when we pray about something so long, it's time to stop praying about it and praise about it. Amen. Thank God for it. Thank God for what he's done. Thank God for what he's going to do. Thank God for what he's doing right now. He says, do it with thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you. And you do it with thanksgiving in such a way until you thanking him for the situation being better, even when the situation is not better. All right. Lord, I just thank you. I don't know what the devil is talking about. I don't know what the people are talking about. God, I thank you. Have you found anything to thank him concerning? Is there anything in your life that you got to say, Lord, I just thank you. I'm trusting you enough, Lord, until I just thank you. Let your requests be made known to God. Let your requests be made known. Tell God about it. Tell him about it. Lord, this is what I want. And it's, it's, it's not unreal to write down a list of what you want in life. It's not unreal to, to, to write down things that you don't want to happen in life. Habakkuk so says, write the vision. The vision is also your prayer. So write the vision. Make it plain. 
And if you have to start over again, write it over again. Prior to building this building, I used to sit on the side of the bed and sketch out a building. I didn't like that. When that came out, all it up to sketch out of By the time it got 2 o'clock in the morning, so stay the screen, go to bed, leave it alone. So the next night I get up, next morning, at break time on my job, sketching out the building. I'm putting it before the Lord. I want the Lord to see it. I want the Lord to hear it because I want the Lord to do something about it. And then I start thanking him for it. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. So, somebody said that when they walked out here, and it was it was a oh the forest. People saw nothing but trees and forests. While they saw trees and forests, I saw a soul mind where lives would be changed, where hope would be renewed, where fairness would be restored. Young people will be made the better. And when you walk in faith, you got to see it before it happens. And Paul said, if you see it before it happens, you can do it in thanksgiving. He says, pray without ceasing. Pray and supplicate before the Lord with thanksgiving. Then let your request be made known. We'll look at Matthew chapter 6. When we, when we see Matthew chapter 6, Jesus have, has an order in which he wants to pray. He says, when you pray, you ought to pray like this. Our Father, call on the right God. Call on our Father. Who art in heaven, admit that he sits in heaven and looks low. He says, hallowed be thy name. You ought to be praising him, adoring him, thanking him. Lord, I know who you are. I praise you for what you do. I praise you for your very existence. That's why the Hebrew writer says, if any man will come to Christ in faith, they got to first believe that he is. This word, these words, he is, mean that he exists. You got to first believe that God exists. There are people that don't even believe that God exists. They just believe, I guess, that they inhale and exhale and breath comes in and out. I guess they believe that their, that their, their nerves just lines out on its own. But you have to trust him and believe in him with thanksgiving. Make your request known to God. Verse number seven. In the peace of God, which surpass all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. He says if you pray, if you supplicate, if you rejoice, if you have thanksgiving, even before you have what you've asked, the peace of God will surpass all understanding. You will have a peace, you will have a comfort, even in the midst of your troubles. He says the peace of God. He says that you would have peace. There are folk who have million dollar homes and have no peace. There are people who have a cow, have cow king beds and don't get a lick of sleep. There are people who have country clubs. Then they go and they play golf and do whatever else they do at a country club. And they go there to try to find peace. But they can't find peace. There are men who have women. Women who have men. And women who have women and men who have, have men. And they can't find peace. They tried it. They tried her. They tried him. And they tried them. And they still don't have peace. The Bible says when you talk to God. When you take your supplications before him, you intercede for somebody else because you are a sacrificial lamb, a sacrificial person unto God. You are a sacrifice unto God for other people. It says when you pray and you supplicate, when you have thanksgiving, there will be a peace that come over you. How many of you need peace? How many of you need a peace, a, a, a calmness, a a settle in your spirit. Something that the world can't give. And then he says, 
it surpasses all understanding. There will be a peace that come over you that you can't even explain. I don't even, I don't even know why I act like that. I don't know why I'm so calm in this circumstance. I don't know why I'm so calm in this situation. I don't know what's going on with me. It's because God has peace that surpasses your understanding. You don't even understand it because God gives you peace. We ought to be asking God for peace. Ask God for peace that surpasses our understanding. Ask God for peace that the world can't give and the world can't take away. He says, verse number seven, I'll leave it alone. He says, it surpasses all understanding. And this same peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. This word God is a military term. It's, it's like when there's a war going on, there are walls that are built up to stop the enemy from coming in. God wants to guard our hearts. God, this peace that God has will guard our minds. You will have a stable mind. You won't be frustrated. You, you won't get so agitated and so anxious and make God do something that God will not do. It's, it's walls. God in our hearts. God in our mind. That's why we used to sing that little song. Little feet watch where you go. Little mind watch what you think. Little hands watch what you do. We're trying to tell our young people to guard their hearts and guard their minds. The fact of the matter is we cannot guard it on our own. We need Jesus to do it. Amen. Because if we could guard it on our own, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. Mm. If I could guard my own heart, then guess what? I wouldn't have made all these mistakes I made. I don't know about you, but I haven't been a good Sunday school boy all my life. I haven't made the best decisions in my life. I even make bonehead decisions today. So I need the peace of God to guard my heart and to guard my mind. Whenever trouble hits, we need to think about Jesus and what he's done. Amen. He has been a blessing to us. He even gave his life for us. Voluntarily died for us. Voluntarily laid down. I mean, he was plum dead. Anybody from the city know what plum dead is? All the way dead. We got one person that may know what plum dead is. I mean, he was all the way dead. He was dead, dead. No breathing dead, no blood flowing dead. He was dead. They laid Jesus in a borrowed tomb. He knew he was going to be laid in his tomb. But the good news is he gave us hope in the fact that he rose early that third day morning. Rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. And now he can guard our hearts. He can guard our minds. Young people need their hearts guarded. Senior saints need their hearts guarded. All people need their hearts guarded through Jesus Christ. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. This is a moment that we come to realize that Jesus is the Christ who gave his life as a ransom for you and me. He died on Calvary and rose early that third day morning from the dead. He acknowledges us. He receives us. The Holy Spirit says, come. If you never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is your moment, this is your opportunity. Just bow your head with me and invite him into your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. 
Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, trusting in the story of Jesus Christ, you're saved, you're born again, and you're on your way to heaven. If there's someone in the room who wants to come and spend time in prayer just for a few moments, you can come down and launch your prayer, your prayer before God. Anybody.
as we move into 2024, we're looking forward to our Bible study time. We'll be studying from the Experiencing God book, Experiencing God, Experiencing God. Either of these two is fine, either of these two books is fine. One is uh, one that was copyrighted in 1990, the other one, the rust color one, has been redone. Both of them have the same information in it. So if you would, um, pick up one of those books on Amazon or wherever you buy your books. And um, as we move into the month of February, we'll be studying, studying the experience of God and we're hoping that it will take us throughout the whole year to finish it. Great study, great book. Please join us for experiencing God. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests? Let us stand to be dismissed. If you want to give your offer by way of electronic mean, you can do so by giving to Zell. Our Zell account is lifting dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zell account is lifting dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. If you're present with us tonight, you can bring your offering forward. You can pick up an envelope and you can bring your offering forward. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We honor your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for blessing us and carrying us over one more time. We ask you to bless us in our Bible study, bless us in our church service, bless us, Father God, in our Sunday school. We pray, Father God, that you take, you bless us to take seriously prayer, evangelism, and discipleship. Lord, we lay our goal of reaching 50 souls before you this year. We pray that you bless us to be on fire, to get on fire, to catch on fire to reach souls for you. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us and bless our lives. Bless our church to be a beacon light in a cold, dark, and dismal world. A light that shines bright, Father God, that other men, women, boys, and girls can see. We pray, Father God, that you bless us tonight as the choir come to sing unto you that they will give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. We ask you, Father, to dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join each other in singing. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you, you are dismissed.